It's interesting having a conversation with the girls because we're gonna get to a different topic here. Brandy and <laughs> Brandy and Everly chose the songs, and um, yeah, spot on. All right, to get started this morning, I was gonna ask you a question to get your uh, your brains rolling. What you've been doing is the question on the screen up there. What you've been doing, as in, how do you worship God? Go. How do you worship God? What are ways that you, by yourself, with other people, how do you, how do we worship God? With your actions. Absolutely. What's another one? With your work. That spelled right? Oh. What are you talking about? Those are your vowels anyway. <laughs> work and worship, same word. Study. Study, there you go. Prayer. Hey. Yeah. Thoughts. Keep going, or is that a right? Life, all encompassing. That's interesting. I wouldn't. How you spend it, how you earn it. Hmm. There you go. Yep. Obedience. Obedience. Teach, disciple your children. Go to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1 is where we're going to be. I don't know if I want to ask you this, qu this question. Um, yeah, let's do this. I wanted to, to explain where this is coming from. So last week, Matt had you go back to Genesis and kind of do a review. I wanted to pause this week, time out. And, and not forget where we've been over the last couple of weeks, which was the high holidays, the whole month of September. So we're, we're getting halfway through October. Uh, I asked Matt and uh, a, few of the, a few of you guys, 
what did you think of the holidays this year? What did you know? What was meaningful? We've done them for a couple of years. Some of you might be brand new to the high holidays. Why? Why do when you flip a calendar in the United States of America, why does it say this weird word on there, Rosh Hashanah, Rosh Hashanah? How do you how do you even pronounce that? Um, so, answer this question: How did you? How do you worship God? And think about what you did over the last couple of weeks. What are we missing up here? Okay, what did you specifically do over the last three big holidays? Give me an example of something you did. What, um, Heather? Big time reflection. Remember. Um, uh, fasting. Along with, anybody think about this? Eating, I should also say baking, bread, eating bread with honey. Was that worshipful? Was making the dough and braiding it, was that worshipful? I wouldn't think of those, you know, ask me in April, how do you worship God? I probably wouldn't say, making bread or eating it with honey, but it had a specific purpose that you shared. It was special. And then we did Yom Kippur. We came in and kind of did a prayer walk type thing, and, and that included reflection and repentance and reading Jonah, you know, and thinking about where you've been, where we've all been. All right, I didn't want to forget that because that's kind of the idea of, of today was uh, I had been saying to Matt when we looked at this date on the calendar, I wanted to talk about some things coming out of the high holidays um, and do some reflection. So that's where we're going with this. So Isaiah chapter one, if you go there, when you look at verse 11, let's see, Isaiah 1, 11 through 14. Somebody want to read that? Alex, aggressive voice. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices to the Lord I have had enough of burnt offerings and rams, and the fat of wealth as beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls, or of lambs, or of goats. Keep going through 14. Uh, when, you come, when you come to appear before me, who has required you to trample into my courts, bring no more vain offerings. Incense is an abomination to me. Do most of Sabbath and the Okay, thank you. Look at those three verses, 11 through 14. And the question, the next question is, drew a line here. We wrote what we do today, what, what they was doing. In the Old Testament, in his three verses he just read, what were the people doing to worship God? Sacrifices. Burnt offerings. Incense. Prayer. Festivals. Convocations. What was the other one? Assemblies. Do what? Assemblies. Assemblies. And one of the translations for that word. Yeah. Gatherings. It's the same word also used for Passover which can be lumped into one of the obviously many meaningful festivals. This is what the people were doing, and God says, I'm tired of it. Or through Isaiah, through vision, verse 1 of that says, this is the vision that he had and the conviction that he wanted to share. So when I read this and, and looked at this, I thought to myself, we, uh, this is a problem. Because 
This is what they were doing. This is what they were used to doing. These were very holy things. These aren't bad things, right? These are very holy things, good things. Um, methods to move you closer to God in obedience, absolutely. And I would, I would ask the question, I think the same could be said of all of this. I don't think anybody in here would say, like, I don't think these things are harmful. I think when we are proactive or we're intentional, all of this can move us in, in, closer in our relationship with God. And just like this did. But the verses say, I'm tired of this. It's a stench. This doesn't even smell good to me anymore. And then verse 15, when you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Why? Your hands are full of blood. So even when you voice your prayer to God, he says, I'm not even going to listen in verse 15. Rough. So what do we do when our hands are full of blood and we have guilt? The verse that was on my mind over the last several weeks from Rosh Hashanah at the 40 Arpent was Micah 7.19. I didn't even know where that verse was. We had just quoted it plenty of times. I'll, if you want to turn there, it's hard to find. It's on the last page before Nahum, Micah 7.19. Actually, it's probably worth it because it's, it's something that a couple years ago I kind of circled and I wrote next to it, Rosh Hashanah, because it's basically the, the main verse that we reference. Micah 7, 18, 19, and 20. Everybody found it? It's a little odd, odd to find. Who is a God like you? It starts with 7, 18. Pardoning iniquity, passing over our transgressions, for the remnant of his inheritance, he will not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast love. Hesed. Verse 19. He will have compassion on us. And maybe the key word in that sentence is again. He will again and again and again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. He will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. He shows faithfulness to Jacob, steadfast love to Abraham, and have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. I read through that and read through it and read through it. And I wrote down all the Hebrew words and I kept looking, what is the meaning of this? I can't figure out the meaning and, and the direction of this whole thing. Well, what's the next slide, Allie? It's the um, picture? Uh, yeah. Do what? Oh, wait, no, it's Exodus 19. Oh, okay. So, I think I'm out of order, but I'll tell you what these are. If you go back to Isaiah, when I think about the words from uh, hurl your, your sins into the sea, Isaiah, the first verse after 15, your hands are full of blood, verse 16 says, wash yourselves. Wash yourselves. And the word for that, I thought to myself, was well, going to be baptism or mikvah, but it's not. It's laundry. It's, I mean, it's, it's not laundry, sorry. It's bath, bathe. Grab some soap and scrub. This is like physical dirt. Then I looked at Exodus 19, one of the famous chapters that talks about what God is, who God is, who God wants us to be. I will make you a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And the first thing you have to do, though, Abraham says, is go wash your clothes. And that verse is not, I mean, that word, that Hebrew word is not mikvah either. It's not the same as this one. It is basically laundry. It's suds them up and purify, wash, physically wash your clothes. So I guess I was a little confused at this point. I didn't understand why Rosh Hashanah, we talk about throw your sins into the depths of the sea. And then there's these other instructions about washing. And I thought, I guess I started pausing because water is such a big deal right now in the salt water in our parish, the drinking water. And then Thursday or Wednesday, Thursday was a big rain forecast. And it was like, oh, street flooding and neutral ground parking and guys at work get to wear special uniforms when there's bad weather. It's like, it's just a, such a big deal. Water is such a big deal right now. And like lots of conversations around, you know, around us, around the parish. Well, 
when we were out at the 40 Arpent, uh, not long after that, I was at our jail. You see what that is? A horse, horse trough. And it's filled up with water and some, some water's leaked. The, the basketball court is wet. We were in the yard where they do recreation. And the very back, you can see the fence and the razor wire. There you go. Thank you, Allie. Different churches and different pastors and volunteers come in and do Bible studies with inmates. I found out that there was a church that was going to come in and do baptisms. And by the time the evening was over, they probably had gone through 20, 25 people. Guys, girls, black, white. And before they dumped the water, go ahead, I told them to stop, and I started taking pictures. We had just talked about at the 40 Arpent, throw your sins into the depths of the sea. And when I stood out there on the bridge with Everly and Nora, and I threw breadcrumbs into the water, you saw them for a few seconds and it floated, and then you didn't see them anymore. And that water is you know, kind, of, kind of dark or kind of dirty or whatever. But you would, the idea is like you turn your pockets out and it's all gone. And we were standing there with these guys and talking about, there, there it goes. When I stood there and I watched that water go across the basketball court and off into the grass finally and dry up, I just stared at it and I took this, these pictures and just... I didn't know one single person that got baptized. This lady was standing there and she was asking them their names because she gave them a little certificate. Later, she went home, printed them, and gave them a certificate with the date on it so they would remember. One name I recognized, and it's because the guy's got a second-degree murder charge on him. When I knew that by the time the water happened, I was staring at this water and thinking, there goes some pretty serious offenses in their life. But when I stared at the water at the 40 arpit with my girls and I thought about the selfishness and the laziness and the crap in my life going into the water, I wondered, <laughs> is that water at the 40 arpit deep enough? I don't know how deep that water is, four feet, 10 feet, I don't know. And then I stood there and I looked at the basketball court and I thought, was the horse trough deep enough? Is there enough water to wash away the accusations and the trouble that these guys and girls are in? And I went back and I found out there are some pretty serious charges against the people that were in that group. So water was on my mind asking the question, what are the accusations against them and, the, and what are the, the accusations against me? And is there a difference in how God will forgive and wash away right there? and what I had out at the 40 Arpent. The day that that happened was September 11th, and I couldn't get over the idea that our whole nation had a new appreciation for freedom and independence from September 11th, and the fact that this group of people, 20, 25 people, were dunked in a horse trough inside of a jail facility on September 11th. The freedom and the independence that they now understand or that they've demonstrated that day is on a whole new level. It's, it stopped me. stopped me enough to take a picture and to tell that group of people, getting choked up saying it, this is incredible. So what does that mean? What is the difference in those two instances and the forgiveness level and water? I went to lunch this week with a friend. He was by the courthouse and he called me and he said, you want to go to lunch? And we go sit down and we're starting to eat our sandwich and he says, uh, so I got to tell you something. I went to a baptism this week 
And I said, you did what? What are you talking about? He's Catholic. He went to a friend, a family friend, invited him to go to celebration down the road, and their high school daughter was being baptized at their church at, at celebration. And so the conversation just kind of ensued, and this isn't, I'm not telling you this for any certain reason, like it wasn't earth shattering, but it was convicting to me because he had never seen a baptism before, a, a dunking, immersion. He had never been to a Protestant service. And I said that to him and he said, what's Protestant? And I said, well, if you're, if you're not Catholic or Jewish or Muslim, I mean, it's, that's pretty much the categories that you're in. So Baptist and, and then celebration, like non-denominational. So we were just talking about what this means. And it's the first time he's ever heard a sermon like that at a church, like, I guess, more like ours. And he had never seen somebody go up bloop, in the water like that. And I said, well, that's interesting they do that. I said, have you ever heard of the idea of, of being baptized in, in like living water that's not in a baptistry? And we talked about, um, he said, yeah, that kind of makes sense. And I said, he said, what's the difference? I said, I don't know, but thousands, if not millions of people have been baptized in the Jordan River. They travel to Israel, that's Everly and my dad, and he dunked her, and then Sean and I dunked Nora in the Jordan River in Israel. But the interesting thing was a couple minutes later, because we've had this conversation in this, in this group, what's, how many times are you supposed to do this? What does it look like? My dad and I had this conversation that when he was a kid, the, re, the Reformed Church in Michigan would um, sprinkle you as a baby. And I didn't know for many years that when he was about 19 and he got a lot more serious about his faith when he met my mom, he chose to be dunked. And that was his choice. I didn't, I didn't know that. But he's gone back several times and he's been through this. Sean and I were in the water. We dunked Nora and then we stepped off to the side and we were looking and it was so awkward because we did not know what to do. But instead of somebody taking you and touching you, you know, and holding on to your hair and going like this, we walked over to the side, out of the way. Nobody was looking at us and we both just and flushed and dunked ourselves. And I got to thinking about maybe the, there is a difference. Maybe the difference that somebody taking you and they have control over you and they go back, you can't stand up. It's one of the most awkward positions, right? Water coming up your nose. You're relying on their strength to make you stand up. But what's the difference if you go over and you put your face down What's that image, right, of surrender? And it's your choice to bury yourself and then stand up under your own power. Obviously, only with God's power are you going to do this life. And I say that because the word came up this week with Walt, the word symbol. What is this whole thing, right? It's a, it's, it's a symbol. And the next picture is another symbol. You guys know what that is, right? Huh? It's a mikvah. What did you say, Sean? Well, yeah, it's steps. It's a cistern, okay? Uh, it's a Google image is what it is. I went back through all my Israel pictures, and I couldn't find that I took pictures of mikvahs. Every site that we went to last year was mikvahs. No exaggeration. Every ruins, every ancient city, everything had these. So we're going along at like the second or third place, and we see another example of these mikvahs. And this lady in the back of the group, because most people don't know the idea of a difference between a ritual bath, mikvah, with spiritual meaning, versus using soap and being washed and scrubbed the pits kind of thing, and then a baptistry that we think about as Americans. So we're looking at, like I said, the third or fourth site, and this lady in the back of the group says, oh, these, these people are squeaky clean. Because it was just over and over, this mikvah, mikvah. She just kept, they kept telling us, all oh, these people bathe, they bathe, they bathe. And it just blew my mind when I got to thinking about, do you guys not understand what this means? It's a symbol, as Walt and I were saying, we're talking about. But people did it over and over and over. Why? Because you wouldn't do any of these things if you hadn't done that first. There's a symbol, there's a ritual, there's a tradition, there's a method, there's a means, and there's a, a, a beautiful, um, I don't know if the word's feeling, that you would do that before you would go through one of these. 
Symbol. Next slide, symbol. Everybody know what that means? Oops, sorry, go to the next one. Everybody knows what that means. It's a symbol, it means you don't park here, or this is a special place, or this is reserved. Next picture. You don't do that here, it's a special place, this is reserved, or, or this is, uh, there's chemicals here. For whatever reason, you don't do that, you don't smoke in this one area, right? We know what symbols mean. So, the symbol of a mikvah, the symbol of, of dunking yourself, you knew what it meant. You were trying to come closer to God. All right, back to Isaiah. Back to Isaiah. We read verse 16, wash yourselves, remove the evil, and cease to do evil. Verse 17, but learn to do good, seek justice, correct oppression, bring justice to the fatherless, and plead the widow's cause. Sounds a lot like Micah 6, 8 that we've all seen on Etsy and all kinds of places. Micah 6, 8 sounds just like that. Learn to do good, correct oppression, and bring justice to the fatherless. Verse 18. Let us reason together, says the Lord. Your sins are like scarlet. They shall be white as snow, red like crimson, and they'll become like wool. And it actually is, they'll become like white wool. I looked that up and wanted to know why. I get the idea that scarlet is red and whatnot, but what's the picture behind that? The Hebrew word, right? Always a, a, a picturesque language is that when a locust would die and it would grab onto a tree and it would have, uh, it, its, its babies would go, when it would die and it would start to rot on the tree, its carcass, it would turn red. And that was what you would grab as the dye to, to dye things. So if you want to take some imagery there, through death, red, that's the image for scarlet and crimson that we have today, and that, that was the reason in the, in the song there. Verse 19, though, if you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. If you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten by the sword. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. There's a lot in, these, in this progression, if you're looking at this almost linear, is that I don't appreciate your worship. You need to wash yourselves. You need to do these things, verse 17. Then you'll have this forgiveness, verse 18. But if you don't, verse 20, you shall be eaten by the sword. I didn't understand what that meant, so here's the words for it. The word eaten is to be devoured and wasted, consumed like a drought or a fire. We were talking this week about how dry our lawns are getting, brown and crusty and crisp and dead. If you don't deal, if we, if we don't deal with the stuff in our lives, we're dry, we are usually consumed by that crap. It devours us from the inside out. And it's like at some point you just can't even get past the dryness in your life and the crusty. It's like a drought. It's just, it's eating you up from, from the inside. But a sword, consumed and devoured by a sword. The word sword was also knife or dagger, a tool for cutting stone or a mattox. I started to picture all those things and I thought to myself, if you ever, we were just talking about the movie um, <coughs> Scream, Exorcism and Scream. The movie Scream came out when we were in high school. They had a dagger and the whole point of that stupid movie was they would slice at somebody and they were trying to cut just the surface so you would see blood but it wouldn't really do damage. But you guys know the damage that a dagger and a knife can do to the human body, which is gross. but tool for cutting stone. And I thought about a grinder. When you put a grinding wheel on, do you cut stone or tile or granite? The dust and the noise and the damage that does to stone is one thing. I cut my, uh, this one, I cut my finger this summer with a grinder and went deep to the bone. 
That stuff does damage to the human body. And then a Maddox. Does anybody know what a Maddox is? I didn't know what that word was. I thought this was called a pickaxe. And then Matt Williams one time said, hey, get a Maddox. And I didn't realize that's what this was. I used this this week to dig a trench in my yard about 30 feet, and my shoulders hated me for it. This, I kept hitting rocks and oyster shells. That can do a lot of damage. It tore through the dry ground in minutes and just kept going, like I said, 30 feet or so. Let me read that sentence again. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be eaten, consumed, and devoured by a knife, a dagger, a maddox. I bring all this up because my question is for this, this week, this season, all this stuff, all this right here, Matt's favorite question, how's that working for you? And I, I hate that question. I feel like it's, a, it's reflecting on where you're at. Um, but I feel like it's, it, it, and it has the best intentions, but sometimes I, I feel like it's asking, are you insane? Right? You're doing the same thing, expecting different results, but you're not getting there. And I'm asking that because this is all great, and we know it's all great, and then God looks at the people and says, it's a stench. I don't want any of it. So I'm asking, we just came out of these high holidays, and the idea in the American calendar is that you go through New Year's in January, everything's different, and you go to the gym and all that kind of stuff, when you make resolutions for the new year in January, and you move on with life. Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah and Sukkot have the essence of a new year and a new beginning and reflection and something changing in your life. And so my question to all of us is, how's this working for us? Study. There's a new link. It came out in the email. Allie's got it back there. It'll be up on the screen again in the announcements. If you're not doing some kind of Bible study, of all the places, Glenn Beck, which has always been politics and radio and all this kind of stuff, he's on the radio this week with Skip Moen saying, please look at God's Word. And he could not have made it any more plain. And you look, open the study. It is Imunah is mentioned the first or second day. You're thinking, who talks about Imunah besides the gathering? Oh, Glenn Beck? If you need another resource, it's right there. If you, like me, if you hate fasting, skip a meal, and when that stomach growl comes, ask yourself over and over, God Almighty, what are you trying to show me? In my American comfort, we were talking last night about, was the chili good? Was the dessert good? Was this good? And I thought to myself, am I just a fat American right now that's not pausing to say, thank you for this community, but God Almighty, I'm not consuming, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not criticizing chili and desserts, I'm asking what, who's missing from this group? Who needs community around me? Am I willing to serve this community or am I just sitting here going, man, that's pretty good. So I look at this list and I want you to ask yourself, is it working for you? We came out of the high holidays and there was some beautiful imagery during the holidays, during, during each one of them. And Sukkot of all of them, right? We stood right here, we took a family picture with the leaves and all this stuff. And the idea is you're supposed to look up and see the stars and you're supposed to say, God, you have provided everything and then some. So we're going to go, in a couple weeks, we're going to go to Bogachita. I hope all of us in this room are going and then extra people that aren't here. And you're going to, we, we, we are going to be out in nature, right? To look up at the stars and to say, God, you've provided everything. It's, it's the best part of camping is perspective. But I also put this picture in here. That's from a couple years ago. We didn't get to do this last year. We didn't get to go last year. If you've got some stuff, and I've had, I don't know, more than one conversation this week that I knew there was people that have gone through crap this year that I think could really appreciate that.
forgot one. And I didn't expect you guys to say it, but I wanted to write it up there because I think far too often we forget how significant it can be and how symbolic it can be and how powerful with a lot of substance it can be to say, I've got to bend forward with my hands up and dunk in the water to say, God Almighty, wash me clean. And we see it a couple times in Scripture with different words used. But I think it can be powerful. And if it's something that you want to do in November when we're up there, I hope you, uh, hope you bring it up. On Saturday, we'll probably head up to the river and do that at some point that day, before or after lunch. I hope the holidays were good for you, um, but I hope you're doing something to follow up on them. And I hope it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody in here to keep you accountable to it. Because the idea that something like this can do a lot of damage is true internally just as much as it is externally. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. And thank you for the stuff we got to write up on the board and probably so much more. It's, we've learned over and over, you can use a lot of things as avenues for us to worship you. And we are grateful for that. Brandy and Everly chose set a fire. It's a powerful prayer and plead or pleading on our behalf, but I wonder what that could look like if we were caught on fire a little bit more for you. And they chose Zion. And to see the images of the nation of Israel on those pictures brings tears to our eyes to think about the thousands of people that are hurting, but we know it brings tears to your eyes as well and compassion. So we ask for healing. But we also heard those words, scarlet and crimson. We pray for healing in our lives as well. Amen. Amen.